welcome to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, interviews with people who have special insights into education from preschool all the way through adult learning. I'm Jim Sean, your host. We're live streaming every Wednesday at noon, also posted on YouTube and on the Hawaii Educational Policy Center. Uh, today, we are looking at one of the schools of the future with uh, the president of the Mid-Pacific Institute, Paul Turnbull. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me on the show. And let's start with a little bit about your educational background. Sure. Uh, well, I was born and raised in Toronto, Canada, and uh, from there went to a variety of different universities all around. Um, basically uh, became a very big fan of, of collecting bachelors of art. Uh -huh. So uh, after my my third bachelor uh, that led ultimately to teaching. I always knew I wanted to be a teacher, so uh, for me it was, it was deepening my knowledge all the way through. My mom reminded me that, that it didn't matter how many degrees and how many letters I had, if they didn't spell J-O-B, it wasn't going <laughs> to work out. So uh, ultimately I ended up with a master's degree in, in administration mm -hmm. and then moved from Vancouver, where I settled down to Santa Barbara, California with my, my wife. And uh, my final degree was a doctorate from uh, the University of California in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you're, you were administering uh, in, uh, in California. What was your job there? Uh, well, I was fortunate to have many different posts. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the irony is that when we first moved to California, I was applying to be a, uh, an English teacher because I had spoke, or I had been uh, a teacher in the International Baccalaureate Program, mm -hmm. and there just weren't any positions whatsoever. But because I had a, uh, an education that allowed me to be an administrator, mm -hmm. I was able to, to uh, become a vice principal at a junior high school. Okay. And then I became, immediately a couple of years after that, the principal of that same school, and then was promoted to be the principal of Santa Barbara High School, mm -hmm. and then an assistant superintendent over the, the uh, school district in Santa Barbara, and then lucky enough to move right next door to become the superintendent of uh, the, the neighboring school district. So you actually worked up the administrative ladder in, in, in ways that many people don't. They go from teaching boop, right into administration, but you've worked your way up in that, in that whole world, yes? I have, yeah. And I was fortunate to do that because it gave me a great perspective from uh, sort of the younger kids all the way up to the older kids and then mm -hmm. certainly as a teacher an English teacher at that you don't often think about the business of running a school district or uh -huh. the business of um, negotiating contracts and a variety of different things that go into that but um, you know what I didn't anticipate as my career path turned out to be exactly what I needed mm -hmm. to be where I am now at, at Mid-Pacific. Uh -huh. So how did you end up at Mid-Pacific? What attracted you to this private school here in Manoa? Um, you know, interestingly, I got a call. So Mid-Pacific was uh, undergoing a search for its new head. Uh, Joe Rice, my predecessor, had been there for 17 years. An amazing guy, complete curricular visionary, had taken the school to a, another level. Mm -hmm. And at the time, my life was good, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I thanked them for the call, but sort of demurred. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, I got another call and said, no, you should really look. So. Ultimately, the long and short of it is that, that my wife and I looked at the school as parents first because mm -hmm. job skills transfer, mm -hmm. but your, your education and your life as a child is, is more important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we looked at it, everything fit. It was just an amazing place. The community, the school community, but the, the greater Honolulu and Hawaiian community is mm -hmm. very family-centric, which mm -hmm. was very important to us. Mm -hmm. And in the end, when we started looking at the professional aspects, everything fit. It's an incredible school that embraces change and loves the idea of uh, really sort of looking at research and the, and the way that they interact with kids and the, and the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. It just it fits like a glove. Now, MidPAC is how large now? So preschool through 12th grade, we have 1,580 students this year. Oh, okay, so, uh, and I noticed on the web that uh, there's a sentence that says, Mid-Pacific Institute is a research institute. Yes. As opposed to a school, you know, is, is that an important sort of lens or distinction that, that the school makes? It is, and for one particularly important reason, and, and it all involves the switch between the 20th century to the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, um, so it's a longer answer, but, but sure. really what it comes down to is the fact that 
in the 20th century, our experience as students was sitting in a desk, sitting in rows, having classrooms all in rows in a bigger mm -hmm. building, all completely blocked in with a bell schedule. Mm -hmm. Most schools still resemble, resemble that. Mm -hmm. The key element, though, is that the communication is one way. The mm -hmm. teacher is supposed to be the one individual with all the knowledge, and the kids are supposed to be like vessels that are, are supposed to be filled. Mm -hmm. And we only measure how, how your worth as a student based on how much of that water you retained. <laughs> yes. Were you a sieve? Did it all float yeah, out? Yeah, or did yeah. you hold on to it? Uh -huh. In the 21st century, things are happening so fast. And the idea that multiple intelligences mm -hmm. is actually something that applies. It's uh -huh. not just simply a theory created by Howard Gardner and others. Uh -huh. We're at a place right now where we need a didactic conversation that goes back and forth where it's a double loop, meaning mm -hmm. a research institution says teachers have a body of knowledge we're going to impart that knowledge and we're going to help transfer that knowledge so students learn. Mm -hmm. But we also understand that we're not perfect and we don't know everything. So we ask students to help us do that. Mm -hmm. So now we actually have classes where kids are helping us as adults understand things on a greater perspective because we ask them to perform uh, essentially shows of learning. You know, how can you tell us that you learned what you learned? So they're articulate, they're compelling when they speak, they know exactly how to win an argument or, you know, <laughs> or defer if they have to. Um, but all those things together mean that ultimately we hold up research as a very important component of what we do in teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. And then that's buoyed by our partnerships. Mm -hmm. So in particular, um, we are the, the Harvard Graduate School of Education's Research Schools International Partner. Wow. Which means... <laughs> What does that mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, which means that ultimately, so the Research Schools International is a consortium of schools around the world. There's about 20 schools. We were the eighth school invited. And so ultimately, that means we have bookended ourselves on one end with uh, global leaders in, in educational research practice. Mm -hmm. And that means that ultimately we have authentic research that's happening with our students, with our faculty on our campus mm -hmm. every year now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's an exclusive partnership which really represents the Pacific Basin. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the incredible benefits to that means that uh, seven of our faculty are research fellows uh, through the, uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Education this year. Oh, okay. And then we book in the other end with mm -hmm. policy leaders and policy practice. So we involve ourselves with nonprofit organizations. Um, our kids are able to interact with the East West Center and visiting diplomats. Mm -hmm. So they understand the body of knowledge. Mm -hmm. They understand how to apply research. And then they understand how to bring in policy. And when you can do that with kids, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a pretty Okay, vibrant, this is Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, now, you had mentioned the seven intelligences. Uh, mm. Can you talk a little bit more about that and remind us what those are? Yeah. Well, they, you know, the irony is that um, every time you put out a theory, again, yeah. it's the 20th, right. 20th to 21st century, right? So right. you say, you know, is it um, uh, your music, your musical ability? Is it your kinesthetic, your physical ability? Is mm -hmm. it your analytical ability, art, artistic, spatial, all of those kinds of things mm -hmm. together? Mm -hmm. What independent schools tend to do is measure a student's aptitude on an SSAT. Mm -hmm. So it's a bubble test, uh -huh. right? Which then, it's like the baby SAT. And you right, grow right. up and colleges look at the same thing. Uh -huh. What we do is use the elements of those multiple intelligences mm -hmm. now at the front door through admissions, mm -hmm. which is uh, not the norm in independent schooling. Mm -hmm. And to the point where we, what we'll do is say, um, Jim, why don't you bring in an artifact mm -hmm. that tells us a little bit about yourself? Mm -hmm. And this is a sometimes a seven-year-old Jim, okay, <laughs> or a twelve-year-old Jim, yeah, yeah. right, or a fourteen-year-old Jim. Yeah. And the ability for you to articulate the importance of that artifact to oh. you, to your life, and then we ask you to expand that. What does that also mean in a greater context in the community, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is a very international baccalaureate perspective? Mm -hmm. It's the outside looking in versus. We're very myopic. Mm -hmm. We only we mm -hmm. navel gaze a lot. Yeah. Um, the ability for us to do that means that we we operate in a student centered fashion that mm -hmm. says, by the time that the beginning of the year happens, the first day of school, we actually know more about you as a student than many schools around, mm -hmm. and then we impart that knowledge to the teachers over the course of the summer. So we're ready 
for your ability to learn. We know what your strengths mm -hmm. are. We know where some of the challenges may reside. But the best part is because we're student-centered, we build a program around teaming. Mm -hmm. So now a teacher understands that uh, out of a class of 20 students, um, we want certain kids in certain positions because they're going to play off of each other's strengths. Mm -hmm. And the outcomes then are, are absolutely phenomenal. So it sounds like you have a, a sophisticated assessment process. You mentioned the process of a student bringing in an artifact, mm -hmm. articulating it, what it means to them or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be interesting to, uh, do you have a little checklist of, uh, you know, of, of uh, observations about you've invested time? Is there a little team that meets with every student? We, that's exactly right. And so it's, it's an and, and I want to be clear about that. It's not an either or uh -huh. situation. Uh -huh. The pendulum doesn't swing so hard that we don't think about tests. We mm. do. Mm -hmm. the, the core academics are, are a very vital component of every school. Mm -hmm. The admissions process includes that same element. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is adding and. Mm -hmm. So yes, there's a team of individuals from the admissions office. We bring in uh, visits and observations from faculty and administrators. Mm -hmm. So all the way through, the students who are applying have mm -hmm. the ability to actually interact with multiple adults. Mm -hmm. So when we're making a decision, mm -hmm. we want to be sure we're making the most possibly informed decision mm -hmm. um, on behalf of that student. This kind of suggests that when somebody joins your faculty, they need to be brought up to speed with this process, which they might not have ever encountered, yes? Mm -hmm. That's right. And to the point where we have a, um, an internal uh, uh, faculty orientation, uh -huh. and then we also have what we call Kupuho Academy, which is our professional development strand, which allows our teachers to teach teachers. Mm -hmm. And that also uh, widens the scope. Again, a research institution, a mm -hmm. school in the community, but for the community, mm -hmm. allows us to partner with other schools. So charter schools, private schools, uh, public schools. Mm -hmm. We often have many teachers every year coming to us and, and learning the Mid-Pacific way. So you're governed by a board of directors, like other nonprofits or whatever? We are, yes. Yes. and, and uh, how big is that, and who are these people that are guiding this new model? Well, the, uh, so the size, we have a board of trustees. There are 26 board members that well, we have. Well, that's a pretty large board. It is, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. And coming from my, my former life as a superintendent, yeah. my board was comprised of five democratically elected individuals. Mm. And this life is a much preferable life for me as an individual because I have 26 folks, which is a bigger number, mm -hmm. but ultimately they are all involved in the school um, in a very supportive manner, mm -hmm. meaning they are either mm -hmm. members of the community at large, they're parents of current students, mm -hmm. they're alumni from the school at mm -hmm. a variety of different um, generations, uh -huh. and they all have the school's best interest at heart mm -hmm. to the point where we problem solve really on a monthly basis. Uh -huh. And because of their vision and their leadership, Mid-Pacific has made uh, great strides over the last 20 years. And these are folks who are busy in their regular professional lives anyway. Yes. Incredibly. They are very successful professionals in their own right. Yeah. And uh, the fact that they make time for us is a, is a, a real gift. Uh -huh. Well, we are talking with Paul Turnbull, the president of Mid-Pacific Institute, a school of the future that exists right now. We'll be back in one minute. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech Hawaii. Center Stage airs every Wednesday at 2 o'clock, and of course you can check out our archives on YouTube or on Think Tech Hawaii anytime you like. Why should you do that? Because this is an art show that I believe is making a difference in lives. We talk with artists of various ilk. We talk with painters and, and writers, playwrights, novelists, poets, sculptors, dancers, um, you name it, directors, uh, uh, actors, of course. And we don't on only talk about what people do, but we talk about how they do it. And my favorite part of the conversation, we talk about why they do it. And it's really common on this show to hear people say, wow, I didn't think about it that way. And it's very common to hear people afterwards who have seen the show say the same thing. And I hear all the time that people are inspired by the conversations that we have. So why don't you join us and be inspired too. That's Center Stage on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock. We'll see you Center Stage. 
Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers, Reformers. We're talking with the president of Mid-Pacific Institute, Paul Turnbull, uh, about a very innovative school. Uh, but I also noticed that you have upgraded and built new facilities. Mm -hmm. and when people think about school facilities, we usually think about a kind of strip mall design of one classroom after another. Mm -hmm. um, Talk a little bit about what you built and, and how it might be different from that. Well, you're right about the strip mall design. It's, it's what we refer to as cells and bells. And I referred to that a little bit earlier as well. So if you think about a, a classroom as a cell and a honeycomb, for example, mm -hmm. all of these things seemingly work together in a very industrial model. It, mm -hmm. it makes sense from a Tayloristic standpoint because we do one thing in one room, and then we do another thing in another room, and mm -hmm. we have 45-minute schedules, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, though, what we find, though, is that it, it, instead, if you go from that honeycomb to an Iowan farm field where all you see are silos, mm -hmm. those silos don't talk to one another. They mm -hmm. are acting as disassociated, independent entities. Mm -hmm. And the real world simply doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. For us to think about um, science, for example, if you have biology, chemistry, and physics acting independently from one another, well, it's not as though you, the human body accepts that kind of reality. Right. So we look at our facilities in the same way. Mm -hmm. To the point where um, our master plan says, if we're going to put facilities together, we should have education at the forefront of that conversation, not the architecture of mm -hmm. building a facility. Mm -hmm. And that's because in the end, it's the way that we're breaking down silos, we mm -hmm. want to integrate cross-disciplinary approaches, mm -hmm. which means we have to integrate the conversations that happen mm -hmm. across those disciplines, mm -hmm. which then means that our facilities have to be open enough that they actually force people into the mode of crossing paths, changing ideas together, mm -hmm. and then that allows our adults to stand on the back and actually guide those discussions. Mm -hmm. We go away from the cells and bells, the rows of desks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kids are now very, very mobile. So the, uh, the usual walls are not there, or they're movable between activities? That's right. Yes, exactly right. So um, over the course of the last probably 12 years or so, we've built buildings increasingly with very mobile structures and open space design. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, the Weinberg Technology Plaza, for example, is sort of the, the first big place that you see. And it was based on the MIT Media Lab, meaning um, you have probably four classes running all at once with really one enclosed classroom. Mm. All the other ones are completely out in the open, working together mm -hmm. and interacting in a way that allows that, that discourse that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. The newest building on our campus, Wood Hall, that was uh, designed and built for our sixth grade team, allows the sixth graders then to bring all of their skills together. So 125 students may be in the morning all together sitting uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the open commons, no walls. Mm -hmm. And then when they break out into academic discipline classes to get the core foundation of what they need for that activity, mm -hmm. they go to what are essentially classroom spaces. If it needs to be quiet, we close the walls. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't mm -hmm. need to be quiet, and our emphasis is on projects and getting those kids working together, we open the walls up. Mm -hmm. So our facilities have to work for the faculty because the faculty are incredibly uh, talented and, and they know exactly how to bring those kids together. Does the flexibility mm -hmm. extend to uh, time on task and a, a bell schedule or, or that you know the length of the school day? How does time fit into this model? That is a great question, and I think that's the thing that that. Um, really great schools in this century are still working on solving. Mm -hmm. So um, in some ways, we're still traditional. So we have an elementary campus, a middle high, or middle campus, and a high school campus. Uh -huh. The high school and the middle campus have different bell schedules, predominantly because the developmental needs of kids who are uh, 11 years old to 12 and 13 years old are slightly different mm -hmm. than 14 to 17. Mm -hmm. However, what we are finding is that the, the study of time is increasingly important in this regard because what we're doing, what a traditional school does, and this is actually where the research institution comes in, the ability for us to really sort of dig deep and, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. do a diagnostic test on ourselves. Mm -hmm. What we find is that middle school kids, just because we say that you are an eighth grader, and this is true of any school, K-12, right, right. 
just because you're an eighth grader doesn't mean you're not able to contribute to a ninth or a tenth grade discussion in certain subjects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we don't allow that to happen because a bell schedule may be different. Right. So what we need to do is actually look at the use of time, to your point, mm -hmm. and determine whether or not we can look at a schedule that allows more interaction between students of different grades, mm -hmm. but more importantly, more interaction of faculty mm -hmm. from middle school to high school and elementary to middle school. So is there a bell schedule at all? Or, you know, give us a feel for how you manage time at the elementary, middle, and high school level. At the, I'll go from the high school down. Okay. So from the, at the high school level, we have very long block periods. So most schools will offer maybe six to seven periods a day. Right. You're in the, you know, 45 to 50 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. Hours go for about 85 to 90 minutes, depending on the class. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to have every class every day. It allows for a, a deeper investigation, mm -hmm. um, a more sort of comprehensive look at any particular uh, mm -hmm. piece of learning. At the middle school level, we're still in that 45-minute cycle, which is very traditional, mm -hmm. but we're looking at the value of that right now. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are many, many models of uh -huh. what, a, what uh -huh. a schedule looks like. Mm -hmm. But again, it's always going to be about the educational program. Mm -hmm. It's going to be about the developmental needs of the kids, uh -huh. the maturational needs. But more importantly, from an adult perspective, are we simply offering the environment that those mm -hmm. students need to flourish? And then at the elementary, to just to round out, mm -hmm. um, there isn't a bell schedule. It's, it's by time. So mm -hmm. it's an inquiry-based model that allows the students and the teachers to mm -hmm. fully develop uh, uh, any particular train of thought and, and unit of study. Mm -hmm. And when they're done, they switch. So we have multi-age classrooms at the elementary. The inquiry base allows kids to really dig in on one topic, which mm -hmm. means that they're mm -hmm. pulling in that integrated approach non-siloed mm -hmm. and um, every single day there's a different specialty so if it's PE or music mm -hmm. or art it's all interwoven looking at a traditional school mm -hmm. people associate certain costs with flexibility versus the 42 minute seven hour or seven period day mm -hmm. are there cost links to these innovations is it cheaper the same more costly it's more costly if we use an old model that simply says you need more people for fewer students. Okay. Right. So if you I have mean a classroom, teachers, more, more teachers. Exactly. Yeah. So if I have a classroom and there are 30 students in that classroom, one teacher, mm -hmm. that's a more cost efficient method. Right. From a learning perspective, it's not that efficient. So mm -hmm. dollars versus actual learning outcomes are two different conversations in that case. Uh -huh. In our case, we're extremely fortunate. We have more funding than, than the average public school system or charter school system. Right. And that funding allows us to add more people. Mm -hmm. So we've determined that a class size of, of about 20 is the right number for us. Mm -hmm. Some folks think that 10 to 12 is the right number. But what we've decided because of, again, research and, mm -hmm. and great interaction, especially with projects, mm -hmm. is that 10 to 12 actually limits the overall scope of skills and personalities as a class cohort. I see. So if we're going to break that class up into different mm -hmm. project-based teams, mm -hmm. we want more kids who bring more to the table in terms of their skills and their personalities. Oh, okay. So a teacher with 20 is about right for us, mm -hmm. which means we have more teachers than the average right. you know, place. Mm -hmm. But what we also do, more importantly, is allow kids to specialize as they get older and get into high school. Mm -hmm. And the allowance of specialty means that we add uh, essentially facilitators and coaches on the side, especially mm -hmm. where technology is concerned. Mm -hmm. So in our technology plaza, you may have a, a faculty member who has a class. You may also have three to four individuals on the side who are experts in certain kinds of technology. So when those kids focus on one particular area, mm -hmm. they now have opportunities to, like a menu, they mm -hmm. can go to an individual and say, we're working on 3D printing today, or we're working mm -hmm. on a laser project today. Mm -hmm. And now we have a, an, another uh, guide for them to help out. Give us a little flavor of the amount and kind of technology you have in these classrooms? Um, it's, that's a, I'll, I'll give you the nutshell version okay, because we, okay. could, we could have a whole show just based on our technology. Right. Um, I'll start by saying that uh, from a graduation perspective, we give our kids the ability when they graduate, and I shouldn't call them kids, our young adults, they're yes. 17. Yes. When they graduate, they have a high school diploma, but they also have the ability then to graduate with a certificate in a certain specialty. Mm 
-hmm. One of those certificates is technology. Mm -hmm. So in that case, what we offer are a variety of things from um, uh, the fact that we have a one-to-one -one iPad program. So all students are in grade with technology wherever they go, first of all, as a mm -hmm. platform. Mm -hmm. And then if they choose animation, digital animation, for example, mm -hmm. we have an outstanding uh, group of uh, uh, faculty in our departments that allow kids to pursue that path, right down to and including a, a former DreamWorks animator who is helping students understand mm -hmm. a very industrialized size of a sort of scope and knowledge. Are we talking mainly high school here for the the specialized diploma I to mean, get yeah to get to that point you're in high school but all the skills actually begin in the elementary and the middle school uh -huh, which uh -huh. is why we can get our kids at the end of the of their journey uh -huh. to be so skilled mm -hmm. the other thing in terms of technology um, just of note uh, we were we were noted as a, a 2014 Apple distinguished school because of the ubiquitous technology we have in our class or our, mm -hmm. our campus and the way we apply it we're also the only um, K through 12 school in the world right now that is offering 3D laser scanning for curricular purposes and historical preservation. Hmm. So um, it's a really hard thing to, to uh, describe what a laser scan does, but essentially if you imagine a, um, a box about the size of a toaster, it shoots out a laser, hundreds of, uh, of thousands of pulses of, of laser beams every second off hmm. of a mirror it goes out in a, a 360 degree circle and then it turns, it pivots on, a, on a, a tripod so that circle becomes a sphere, a 360 degree sphere. That laser, everything that it touches captures it and pulls it into the software. So for example, our kids yesterday were at the um, uh, remains of King Kamehameha III's summer home just off of Old Poly Road. Oh, right. yeah. And so we were digitally preserving the summer home so to the point where our software now has captured all the, re the remains of that particular structure down to the millimeter. So now because of our technology, our kids are in the community uh -huh. studying history, not from uh, the old boring, yeah. you know, somebody else's history, and they flip from page 89 to page 90. Wait a minute, that's how I grew up. <laughs> that's, that's how I grew up too. <laughs> but they're in, they're in history now. They're immersed yes. in it. Mm -hmm. And the technology allows them to capture that that piece, they have to do an ethnographic study. They have to understand first primary and secondary sources. Mm -hmm. They have to understand how to be compelling in their presentation of learning. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, the opportunity to use a kind of, of um, technology that many engineering schools at university are, are starting to now grasp mm -hmm. means that they have a wide variety of opportunities that kids their age just simply don't have around the world. So this laser 3D printer What's the price tag on that? <laughs> so, yeah, the, so the, the whole 3D, well, I'll go through the whole sort of 3D realm, okay. right? So an immersive realm. 3D laser scanning, so what we capture in mm -hmm. reality, that particular scanner is about $60,000. Mm -hmm. There are a variety of scanners that we have, so all the way down to uh, our elementary students who are using laser scanning right now. Mm -hmm. Very much cheaper, much more accessible and we don't have to worry quite so much. Mm -hmm. um, we also then have 3D printing. So a lot of our, our kids are also 3D printing, elementary all the way up uh, through high school. Mm -hmm. That's based on technology and design. So mm -hmm. now kids are solving issues, um, solve the issue of a really uncomfortable student desk. Mm -hmm. We've all been in them. Yes. We all understand these are not meant <laughs> for comfort, yes. right? It's that you have to work hard. Well, our kids now are in a place where they can design them, use software to build, and then 3D print them to make sure that they actually work. Oh, wow. And then the final piece, which is really uh, the really exciting thing. I mean, it's exciting to be in laser scanning, but right now virtual reality is something that is just getting on the scene. Okay, we're going to come back okay. to virtual reality. We're talking with president of the Mid-Pacific Institute, Paul Turnbull, and we're, we'll be back in one minute. Aloha, my name is Roy Cordani. And every Wednesday at 1 p.m., I host Life in the Law, which is a segment of Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, basically, I host guests who have some relevancy to law in Hawaii. And uh, I hope you will continue to tune in. If you have questions, tweet us at Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo. 
Aloha, this is Alice C. Hagen from ThinkTech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show is a bi-weekly show on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. We invite interesting people, entrepreneurs, fascinating leaders who contribute to the social economic well-being of our state. Please tune in to my show, Business Education Spotlight, ThinkTech Hawaii, bi-weekly, Thursday, 3 to 4 p.m. Aloha. Welcome back to an exploration of the School of the Future, which exists today at Mid-Pacific Institute. You were just about to describe the most sophisticated scanning operation that you are able to use at the school. Give, it, give us a little more of that. So for context, yeah. um, the important thing to note is that what we're talking about, again, is breaking down silos between academic departments. Okay allowing kids the use of technology across all disciplines. Mm -hmm. And the most important part at Mid-Pacific is the ability for us to say, here are these opportunities that are not wide ranging in other schools. Mm -hmm. We're gonna allow you to, to use a kind of technology that nobody else has. Mm -hmm. But the, the agreement is you're gonna use it to better yourself and your community. So um, the thing that we're talking about right now in virtual reality is how can you potentially go out, find a place that is not very accessible to the public. In this, in this particular case, it was um, yesterday's field trip. It was mm -hmm. a very muddy field trip with uh, middle school and high school kids to King Kamehameha III's uh, summer home. It's um, fairly, fairly dilapidated now. I mean, it's a, a, late, a, a late 19th century uh, structure. <clears throat> but the, the importance is we go out, we capture it with technology, we put it into a software that looks as though you're watching a movie. So mm. now it is very real. We can manipulate it in terms of animations because now that we have the sort of the core structure of it, we can actually um, build it virtually back to its original beauty mm -hmm. from 1874 when it was uh, last restored. The virtual reality part is imagine, and the, and the, the concept is, is easy to understand, but until you experience it, it's just not the same. So um, imagine watching the television that you have on your screen, but imagine then that you can sync that television into a headset that fits right mm -hmm. on your face. Mm -hmm. And that television screen is broken into two. You have one for each eye. So it's stereoscopic viewing. That stereoscopic viewing is also captured in 360 degrees, up, down, behind you, below you. So by capturing all the video inside that specific structure that is very hard to access, we can export that file thanks to a partnership that we have with GoPro and a variety of other virtual reality firms in uh, California. We can put that into a variety of new virtual reality headsets. So if it's Oculus or the HTC uh, Vive or the Samsung Gear, a variety of others. And then we can make that available to anybody. Mm. So you could virtually visit this place without leaving your classroom. Okay. so. What's going through my mind now is the traditional school in this that you're describing. Yeah. As part of your research, are you looking into what it would take to take a traditional school and move it in that direction? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the, the challenges and the solutions for that journey. Um, well, there's a, a couple of different challenges. Right now, at the beginning of any particular um, sort of technological, a technological environment or, or movement, mm -hmm. things are sort of scarce in terms of resources, which means they're really expensive. Right. That's where we are right now. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the big challenge. If you think about the digital camera revolution, mm -hmm. we went from the sort of the, you know, remember the old film and Kodak mm -hmm. stopped producing film and they realized, oh, we should, probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> yeah. Um, cameras, digital cameras were these big bulky things and they were very expensive. Mm -hmm. Now our iPhones and Samsung mobile mm -hmm. phones have actually better mm -hmm. cameras than we've ever had before. Mm -hmm. And they're tiny and we don't even really think about it anymore. The same thing's going to happen with virtual reality and, and the way that we capture all of that mm -hmm. data. So um, over time that'll solve itself. That's okay. a good thing. Right. right now the thing that I think that's really important for us to understand is when I put on my, my uh, previous superintendent hat. Yes. If we, as an uh, as a private school at Mid Pacific, are going to be again a, a school of the community and for the community, it's a question of how we possibly help our partners, right. our educational partners. Mm -hmm. Which means that um, Google, for example, has Google Cardboard, 
and it's a very cheap method with using mobile phones as that sort of the, the technological component mm -hmm. of putting essentially a field, field trip in a box. Our kids can capture the environment, they can compute within that new environment, and they can create a field trip for our public school neighbors. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what we, we, we intend to do. Okay. That and um, our partnership with the Bishop Museum will allow us then access to the more than 25 million artifacts that the bishop has. It's uh -huh. an amazing place. Yes. And we can help them with a museum in a box. Mm -hmm. it's, it's access, but it's also an understanding on the, on the part of the receiving school to say, mm -hmm. we understand the value of what you're talking about, mm -hmm. and we have the time to implement that. Mm -hmm. So you've got a traditional school set up with cells and bells, right? Yes. So you have physical problems or, or challenges sure. in a traditional school. But I also wanted to ask a little bit about, you, you're talking about about 20 students per teacher. For, for a high school teacher during the week, how many different students would they be interacting with? Depends on the number of classes you're teaching. So oh. if it's 20 students times five periods, hmm. there's 100 students. So it, it's, it's not the same for all teachers? No, um, just look at um, band, for example. Uh -huh. By the nature okay. of band, we don't yes. want four kids right. or 20 kids. We want a really big right. size, right? Mm -hmm. So depending on the, on the discipline in which you're teaching, mm -hmm. your course may offer a, a larger uh, seating capacity. Hmm. I see. So uh, the, does, this, does this overlay with... Uh, the traditional credentials of teacher licenses and things like that? Mm. In the public school system, yeah, there are limitations to that kind of thing. And mm. I know there are supplementary credentials that, that many states will offer you depending on additional uh -huh. hours studied, et cetera. Uh -huh. In the independent study or in the independent school world, that's where we embrace the word independent. Okay. So we understand, for example, that um, a, an individual with a PhD in physics mm -hmm. may have a deep sense of theoretical knowledge but that may not translate to the best teaching practice. Right. So we're able to choose the best faculty for that particular discipline in this particular system. Mm -hmm. We have some folks with no teaching credentials because they are from the industry, a uh, DreamWorks animator, mm -hmm. a mobile application expert who, mm -hmm. who worked at Apple in the Silicon Valley. Those individuals are the right people for us because they understand education, they understand mm -hmm. what we're trying to do, and they understand how to bring students to a, a new level of, of experience. It sounds to me like you're describing a college or a university. Is that really the model that is being recreated here? I suppose in a small way, yes. The, I think the key, the key things to, to walk away with with Mid-Pacific include the fact that we're big enough that we can offer specialties. Uh -huh. So when you graduate, you graduate with your diploma, but you also can graduate with a School of the Arts certificate, mm -hmm. an International uh, Baccalaureate Diploma, uh -huh. which is another advanced certificate, mm -hmm. a Technology Certificate, or a Hawaiian Studies Certificate. Mm -hmm. We're big enough to offer those flavors, so to uh -huh. speak, for you to dig in a little bit more. Uh -huh. But we're small enough that, you know, ultimately, you don't get to be anonymous. Yes. And many kids in adolescence have a, have a natural predilection to say, I got this, I'm good, don't yeah. worry about it. Yeah. We don't let that happen. Yes. So we want to make sure that we guide you along the way because uh -huh. we actually ask kids to fail mm -hmm. by pushing them very hard, mm -hmm. but it's the most secure environment in which to fail. It does sound like the size of the enrollment is an important factor. It is. We have some high schools with 3,000, 4,000, just in the high school level mm. where there's 500 students in every class level. Mm -hmm. uh, so does the size of the school, do you, do you think this could work if Mid-Pac, Mid-Pacific decided to double its size? Uh, it, does size mm -hmm. really matter in terms of enrollment and your approach? For us, I mean, there, that's a, it's a multi-level answer that uh -huh. I can give you, and especially based on my public education experience mm -hmm. in large high schools. Um, for us, size does matter because mm -hmm. I believe that we are right-sized for the reasons that I stated. That mm -hmm. When it comes right down to it, we don't believe in offering 95% of what every other school offers mm -hmm. 
we are focused on a very specific method of instruction, teaching, and learning mm -hmm. in a specific way, mm -hmm. which means that we're looking for students who can handle mm -hmm. a very fast-paced environment, a very creative, fluid environment, but they can also do the rigorous academic uh, mm -hmm. foundational work that the other schools are providing. So that's the, the limit of our size mm -hmm. is akin to understanding that um, the more adults that you have around to, to guide that practice, mm -hmm. the more success you'll find at the end. We have, I think in Honolulu, 40% of all young people go to a private school. Mm -hmm. Where do you fit in this universe of private schools? In terms of? Well, what's your niche? You know, I mean, how are you different from them? Uh, how are you the same? You know? Well, I'd like to think that in the end, all schools are there for kids. And right. if all schools are there for kids, then we are the same. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that based on the things that I've talked about today, I do think that we have some pretty unique differences. Mm -hmm. um, first and foremost, we're a school of yes and, meaning mm -hmm. yes, the tests occur. Yes, there are foundational academics that all students go through. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have college matriculation and our kids are going to the Ivies and the little Ivies and fantastic art schools around mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. But the key to us and the differentiating factor for us is that integration of academic disciplines. Mm -hmm. If it's English or uh, humanities, if it's math and science, mm -hmm. the fact that technology touches everything. But key to that, especially right now at this point in our, in our evolution mm -hmm. educationally, is that this is the 25th year of our School of the Arts. This is the anniversary of a grand experiment that happened 25 years ago. And because of the creativity that comes out of that, and because mm -hmm. we didn't build a silo around that, mm -hmm. Art, design, technology, science, humanities, all of those things are rewriting the script mm -hmm. for the way that education is delivered. Mm -hmm. And in a way, um, we just haven't been recognized or we haven't recognized ourselves how far along the 21st century curve we really are. Uh -huh. So the differentiating aspect is that our kids are now in a place where they're not afraid of a stage. They're not afraid to be in a, an environmental pitch kind uh -huh. of scenario. Yes. They're articulate. They uh -huh. know how to deal with their discomfort in, in a particular situation. Uh -huh. And they understand that failure is not a bad thing. It's uh -huh. a thing, to, be, uh, it's a thing to, to guide your future success. Now, as a research institute, yes. I assume you're studying yourself. Are others studying you? That's a good question, yeah. And, and one of the things that we do, so I talked a lot about arts and technology, but from a management perspective, we're also very um, hard on ourselves. So we have a 122-point metric wow. scale that we look at, and we really carve ourselves up, and we want to know, are we doing the right thing? Because it's all about kids. Is this shareable, this 120-point assessment there yeah. there some of them are most of them are in a black box i see yeah. okay. and one of those things though is the unique perspective of a, being a center of teaching and learning to uh -huh. your point uh -huh. as a center of teaching and learning we want to know how many people are interested in what we're doing uh -huh. and most importantly we had over 500 educators from off island on island public school private school internationally u.s mainland come to learn about the mid-pacific way last year well we're talking with Paul Turnbull, the president of Mid-Pacific Institute, a, a center of teaching, learning, research, innovation, breaking down the silos, many lessons, hopefully, for other schools, public and private. Thank you very much for sharing. We'll be back again in the future with more education, movers, shakers, and reformers. Aloha.